I will be recording this webinar. I hope the recording goes well and that you'll be able to review it later. We hope that this Mars Uranus is not going to crash the systems um, and that this is going to be a great introduction learning experience. One of the reasons I initiated this webinar is to speak a little bit about the astrology education. Many, you know, so many options are available today online. Um, some schools are also uh, in person. <clears throat> but what I find that is lacking, and I see that both through OPA, as I am the current president of OPA, and through my personal practice, it seems that people do not have their knowledge organized. And it leads to fragments of knowledge, what I call sometimes little knowledge that is interpreted as complete. Sometimes people jump too far forward, not having foundations. And as a result, um, they cannot really perform adequately. And we end up having astrologers, people who practice astrology in a way that is, you know, not fully reliable. <clears throat> um, my approach to astrology is based on the idea of evolution tracking the soul journey through the natal chart. And what this means basically is to use the chart not only as a tool to identify particular patterns or traits. You know, if someone is um, great for cooking or a promising engineer or someone you know, needs to have a lot of fun in relationships. <clears throat> We're not just looking at what is, but we want to understand why things are the way they are. Why were you born in a certain place? Why did you have a domineering parent or an absent parent? And so forth. So to me, what is important in chart analysis, and that's the particularity of evolutionary astrology, is that we can see issues, identify issues in the chart, but also track them, source them, and understand that many of our current circumstances are sourced before this life. People arrive in this incarnation with memories, fears, desires, gifts, talents that are not just the product of genetic, uh, you know, genetical source from their parents, but they come from their own personal soul history. And yet, Many astrology systems uh, do not go back to track that. We can look at things psychologically, we can look at things technically in the chart, but can we understand the source of certain traumas, the source of certain behaviors? Some people are already born with post-traumatic stress. Nothing happens in their early life they have, quote unquote, a normal childhood, but they exhibit symptoms of post-traumatic stress, which is often sourced, again, from those past lives. Now, some people say, well, we can make up past lives. How do you know it's actually valid? Personally, I've done quite a bit of research on that and, being, and I've been able to track the chart of people through different incarnations. There aren't many possibilities to do that because it's very hard to get 
confirmation of a reincarnation, let alone the charts. But some cases were confirmed, and we can see that astrology is a very eff effective tool to actually look at what happened before this life. It represents the past, our present, and then where we're going, the future. So this, this course is a very comprehensive program that I'm offering. The enrollment begins now in the course of this spring. However, you can join at other times because most of the material is by correspondence. The important aspect of this course is not just that it covers the very basic to the professional levels, so you're not left behind and you don't have those gaps in your knowledge. But it also connects um, knowledge, the mental knowledge, with a, a spiritual life. We meet together at least once a year. In the course of uh, two and a half years, we meet three times during retreats where we we work on other aspects of our of our development including yoga practice including community so we connect between the groups we learn together and this is in itself a transformative experience so you're not just getting information you're getting knowledge you're getting deep into your own soul work because that's what we're doing we're working on the soul and to work on the soul you cannot just get an internet course it's a process you need to be able to go deep to face your own shadows to understand the nature of this work because you are going to work with people's deepest emotions and you need a proper training for that. So the course is expensive. Relatively speaking, it's about $5,000, 5500 which you can split the amount over many months. So it's easier uh, if, you, if you choose to. You can also uh, pay up front. If you leave abroad, there are different payment plans as well. And if you live in places like South Africa um, or the Middle East, if, if there are enough people in your area, there's also an opportunity to create a local study group and make, make the whole process less expensive. So, my point is if you want to learn i'll meet you there if you're serious if you want to go deep if you want to master this star knowledge from this perspective it's an investment in time in money and in expertise because we want to produce great astrologers so the reason I'm going to talk about the outer planet today is because this has a lot to do with the process of evolution. Their influence is very central. But the course itself covers all the planets pretty much, including medical astrology, relationships, uh, astrocartography, and predictive techniques. So the curriculum you can see on the link, whether the link you received or the link on my website, the curriculum is quite extensive and, and really uh, provides practical tools as well as spiritual understanding. So you will be able to answer both, you know, the deep question about why am I here? What is this incarnation about? but also about um, when can I sign this contract and is it a good day to have surgery or um, 
what's going on with my financial situation. So the purpose to go deep into the spiritual realm is to cover the whole umbrella and also address very mundane questions, which we all have. So we're not just talking above people's head. We're not just, you know, doing some kind of a spiritual bypass. We're talking to people where they're at and we're helping them get to the next step. And there are many uh, testimonials which are usually very supportive of this process. It's, I'm myself very dedicated. So you will be receiving a lot, probably much more than the money's investment. Um, it's about creating abundance in your life as well. And it's about um, understanding how spiritual development works also with financial investment. We don't separate matter from spirit. We create abundance through spirit. So once again, I hope this inspires you to take astrology to the next level. My next um, my next point in this is to also make you understand that as we move into this next phase of humanity, its development with the Jupiter Saturn conjunction in Aquarius next year, beginning an air cycle of conjunctions of Jupiter Saturn's Jupiter Saturn conjunction set the tone for the political climate for the general conditioning and social trends. And the fact that it's going to be in Aquarius and in air signs for the next 200 years or so signals that astrology stars, star knowledge is going to be much more um, central and better integrated. And I, I can anticipate astrology to become better recognized, better understood in our general civilization. So this is not just a hobby. It's not just for your own personal development. It's for you to develop professional skills and master your capacity and change the world, change people, become an instrument that can affect, you know, bring light into darkness. Um, Another word on that is that if we bring good astrology to this world, think about what it can, what are the benefits? What is the gift of astrology? What does it give humanity? Astrology provides clarity, provides perspective. You can look at your life from a distance and understand things. But it also gives a meaning to your life because as you understand astrology, you understand your life and life is not random. There is a universal order and you are part of it. So to understand your chart effectively means that you, you understand your place in the universe, your role, and that if you face difficulties, it is not in vain. Beginning with our current outer planet, which is the subject of our, uh, of our talk today, um, I would just want to briefly go over the general classification of planet. You obviously have the sun and the moon, which are the luminaries. They're also sometimes considered as personal planets in that, in that package because they deal with personal development. But the sun and the moon are actually our central processor. And this is basically the control room of our consciousness. So the sun and the moon are the center through which we absorb whatever is happening and we integrate it and then do something about it. So if we didn't have the sun and the moon, we would simply be a computer that receives data and spits it out and functions mechanically. But 
without any uh, personal involvement. Whatever comes in would come out and would leave you unchanged. So the sun and the moon are what allow you to relate to life, relate to people, and personalize your existence. Like I say, it is the control room, and it is the source of your ego. What is the ego? It's your personal processor. It's your filter. How you filter life, how you see what's in front of you. Not surprisingly, the sun and the moon actually represent the eyes in your anatomy because it does represent what you're able to see. You can, we can all look at the same picture but see something different. And that's our filter. That's the sun and the moon. So we do not see the ego as a negative force. We simply see it as a central processing mechanism. Mercury, Venus, and Mars rule the signs next to the sun and moon. Sun and moon are Cancer, Leo. Then you have the two mercurial signs on each side. Gemini, Virgo, then the two Venusian signs, Taurus, Libra, and the two martial signs, Aries, Scorpio. Scorpio co-ruled by the modern ruler, Pluto. So the personal planets are about your personal development, how you build your house, how you survive, how you develop your value system how you basically establish yourself. Mercury is your navigation system. It's your ability to find yourself, find your way, and it's the ability to function. You know, what button to press, how to start your car, um, going to work, knowing what to say, who to say it to. It's it's that whole logistical aspect of your life and making sure everything is in sequence. Mercury keeps you in rhythm, in sync with the rest of the world so that you don't crash into people <laughs> when you go about your business. Venus has to do with appreciation, with your sense of satisfaction, with what you prioritize in your life, what you like and what you're going to get, because what you like is what you get, is what you want to get. So all the wants and all the, the sensual mechanism that makes you feel what tastes good, what feels good, what smells good, the people you want to be with, and what you want to trade with people, the exchange of resources, and that allows for survival, sustainability. Mars <clears throat> represents your defense mechanism, your ability to withstand gravity, climb mountains, face challenges, overcome resistance, overcome obstacles, face friction, and win every day. So. Every, every time when you go to sleep, every time when you wake up, you made it. That's Mars. You made it through another day. You dodge the bullets. You create new pathways. You made new things happen. And through Mars, you discover all the things you can do. You can build a house. You can build a business. You can make new friends, it's your force, your stamina, your um, energy, your battery, but as I said also, your power. Then we move to Jupiter and Saturn, which typically rules Sagittarius, Capricorn, uh, co-rulers of Pisces and Aquarius. <clears throat> but I want to focus especially on the modern rulership. So Sagittarius 
and Saturn. Um, these two planets meet, like I said, every 20 years. They will meet next in December 2020 at uh, the zero degrees Aquarius, starting a series of conjunctions in air signs. So this one is going to be the first one within about almost 200 years of conjunctions of Saturn-Jupiter. And what do they represent? Our capacity to bring ourselves into a larger context. How we function not only uh, in our immediate environment, but in our society. They represent our mastery. They represent our ability to cooperate, to come to a general agreement about what is ethical, what is commendable, what is true, and things that we want to go by. Values, uh, ambitions, our guidelines. You know, Saturn Jupiter represents our guidebook, what's good, what's bad, how to get to how to be successful <laughs> excuse me how to lead a good life and and how to basically lead other people they also represent the teachers so they represent our teachers who guide us but also ourselves becoming teachers and authority figures so we may guide others based on our own experience and learning mechanism. So what we see from these three groups, the sun, luminaries, personal and social planets, is that we build a life and a functional life. We survive, we do well, we, we pay our bills, we have food on the table, we marry, we reproduce, um, we take care of our health. And it seems like, we covered it. You know, we have all that we need. You know, we have our house with our white picket fence and, and three kids and a lab uh, and a dog. And, you know, we, we're, we're happy. We have a job. We have a family. We, we have an established existence that we can rely on that provides foundation so we can be sane, happy, um, functional, as I mentioned. So these are the visible planets as well. This is why in traditional astrology, they, they were the whole package because before telescopes were invented, we could not track Uranus, Pluto, Neptune, at least that's what we assume because there are some evidence of earlier civilization that managed to track Uranus, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Um, they were not really firmly established as solar system planets. But, you know, there's something about the fact that we reach that boundary with Saturn, the visible planets, and that's indeed our consciousness. You know, that, that functional, happy life in the suburbs, you know, where we have the things we need and we're doing well. But then we discovered the outer planet, Uranus, Pluto, Neptune, not in that order. Uh, Uranus was first discovered in the 1700s. Neptune was discovered in 1865-ish, and Pluto in 1930. So each century brought its, its own discovery of a planet. And that was fascinating because each of these discoveries was um, synchronistically happening as many social changes were happening and we're going to touch on that but the outer planet are what we call transpersonal planets which means that their function is to go beyond 
that sense of security. You know, up to Saturn, from, from the moon to Saturn, we built ourselves and we establish a sense of security that provides um, survival. And then the outer planet take us to a, a step beyond security. They are the challengers. Instead of building, they destroy. They shatter, they surprise, they dissolve. And so we want to understand why. First of all, if we understand that this cosmic order uh, has sense, then we understand that all these planets are like the hands of a clock. And each one represents a particular cycle. So the sun moon cycle are very quick year and month along with the personal planet then the Jupiter Saturn cycle are 12 years 20 years 30 years um, rich representing basically cycles of our development but then the outer planet shift all that and instead of building things linearly one brick on top of another brick to build our fancy house, they do a massive remodel. They gut the floors. And the question is why? In the word transpersonal, there is a need to step outside our own subjective view and experience. So the outer planet function have for purpose to basically objectify our life and help us grow so they basically represent the force of evolution all three of them combined and each one very differently <clears throat> um, to objectify our lives mean that we are starting to look at life from a more global perspective and not just conditioned by our own experience or our own tribe, which is Saturn, Jupiter, but to look at things that can even go beyond this particular time. So they force us to objectify and to look beyond our current circumstances sometimes through shock it doesn't have to be a shocking uh, experience but it can be because if all the personal luminaries and social planet are about building they are also about creating attachments we become attached to our families to our culture to our belief systems to our children, to our families, to our jobs. And so we become identified with all the elements of our lives. And Uranus, Pluto, Neptune come and expose all the limitations of these attachments and basically say to us, whisper in our ears, there is more to life than this. And if we speak of soul growth, you need to go beyond the ego development so they are the transition from egocentric development which has to do with how do i build myself in this life how do i thrive and and survive and and reproduce they take us to what is the deeper meaning of life and are you here to just survive and make money or are you here to expand your consciousness and ultimately to live according to a more global perhaps timeless perception of the truth so this naturally is a humbling process because you you know you you have to doubt yourself you have to doubt your values they force us to look at everything we've built and then create a sense of dissatisfaction 
So whatever we thought was so good, you know, we made it, we are successful, we became the CEOs and we married our, our sweethearts. Then Uranus, Pluto, Neptune come and show the cracks, the imperfections. And it's not just to challenge us for nothing. It's because it shows that our ego has not figured everything out yet. And they take us to a deeper journey that will expose us to um, the greater truth. And so interestingly, you know, we're moving towards um, new cycles. Uranus is about to re-enter Taurus for the next six, seven years. Neptune has been in Pisces since 2011, and it will be there until 2025. And Pluto entered Capricorn in 2008 until 2024. So all of them are going to shift sign about the same time, 24, 25, 26. And you see that they are all in uh, introverted signs, earth, water, earth. And they're all going to move uh, into extroverted signs, Aries, Aries, excuse me, Gemini, Aries, and Aquarius. <clears throat> so let's, let's explore the function of Uranus. How, you know, how is Uranus and how is this, its own cycle working? I'm just going to exit this slide because I want to show you another slide, um, which I don't have. <laughs> I forgot to put it on. So, oh, here it is. Okay. Can you all see this slide? Okay, great. So Uranus stays about seven years in a sign and takes 84 years to complete the whole zodiac. Pluto stays 11 to 32 years in a sign. That's a huge gap, but a total of 248 years. The reason is that Pluto, um, Pluto's orbit is very irregular. It's an elliptical orbit, and as a result, there are times when it comes much closer to the Earth, and then it goes, again, far away from the Earth. And when it comes close to the Earth, it's actually crossing Neptune's orbit and coming closer to the Earth than Neptune is. This happened between 1979 until 1999. For about 20 years, Pluto went faster than Neptune, closer to the Earth, and was only 11 years in the sign of Scorpio during that period of time. Whereas Neptune stays an average of 14 years in a sign and 165 years in, for the whole wheel cycle. So what you identify here is that Uranus is exactly half the cycle of Neptune. It's a one to two ratio. And Neptune, is uh, two-thirds of a Pluto cycle. So it takes three Neptune cycles for two Pluto cycles. So they each have a very close relation to each other. This is their modern rulership. Uranus rules Aquarius, Pluto rules Scorpio, Neptune rules Pisces and the respective houses, 11th house for Uranus, 8th house for Pluto, 12th house for Neptune. So what are they about? You know, we often speak about, one thing, one thing I, 
Uh, let me see people raising hands. Uh, not sure what to do with <laughs> people raising hands. If you have questions, best type them rather than raise hands because you don't know what to do with raising hands. Just chat, tap, you can type them in the chat box. So, one of the things I personally want to avoid when I'm teaching is blanket statements or blanket statements or uh, you know a regurgitating a regurgitation of keywords you ask people well what is Uranus and the immediate question is it's shock it's a shocking change and no one understand what they're really saying and if it is a shocking change we have to understand why why is it shocking? Why, how does Uranus operate? And why does it create this kind of a radical, perhaps, change? And you will see that another keyword that many people use is transformation. You know, you are going, why am I going through this? It's transformation. And why did I split up? It's transformation. And, uh, you know, why is Donald Trump elected is transformation. So we tend to use these terms over and over and over again, and they almost lose, you know, their real uh, essence because it's, it's, it's easy to kind of associate these quick keywords. Um, it, it kind of gives us a sense of... Uh, understanding the terms so we can better understand the charts but we need to go a few steps deeper because transformation is a blanket statement you can't tell your client it's just transformation without explaining a process why the change is happening what kind of change what's the purpose you know, when I ask people about Uranus, we speak about change. When I ask people about Pluto, they speak about change. So what's happening when Pluto squares Uranus? Of course it's change, but what is the square about? You know, we all went through the conjunction in 1965-66. They were conjunct at uh, about 16, 17 degrees Virgo. Then they first started to square in 2010 to 2015. For five years, we had Pluto in Capricorn square Uranus in Aries. And many things happened. Many change happened. But what kind of change? And what? where is Uranus pulling? Where is Pluto pulling? They both are revolutionaries. They both are radical. They're both create transformation. So what's the difference between them? <clears throat> so one of the things that we need to understand is the sequence of development. The way that Uranus helps us in our soul journey to step outside our comfort zone and to better understand the, the more all-encompassing truth is that Uranus represents the need to objectify our lives and step outside of ourselves, par definition. And the way Uranus does that is that it, it elevates us. Uranus is immediately related to height, to going up. The direction of Uranus is towards the sky. It is, you know, mythologically, <clears throat> the god of the skies. And that's why Uranus relates to planes and to space 
and to tall buildings and people who have strong Uranus in their chart tend to be, you know, the Vata people, if you know a little bit of Ayurvedic medicine, Vata people, long, thin, tall, slender um, types of bodies and very airy, you know, the, the birds, people who have you know, who have a strong Uranus, when they buy your house, they want a view. They want to be higher in elevation so they can see things from above. And by definition, Uranus wants to move away from gravity because gravity, Saturn, is very time-space based. It's here and now. And Uranus wants to go to the bird eye view and observe life from perspective, from a distance. The same way, whatever planet you have conjunct Uranus, Uranus is going to try to elevate that planet and it, to objectify, to create an emotional detachment so that you may understand that is one of the key words of Uranus, what it wants, the reason it does whatever it's doing when it crosses your planet is to bring awareness and understanding. This is why Uranus has to do with knowledge, with the higher self, which means the part of you that knows the part of you that understands. And the way to better understand is to, like we said, objectify, step outside yourself. And this is immediately related to uh, the Aquarius principle as well. So when I say elevate, you know, it is about detaching from gravity and going to these greater heights but it is also doing that symbolically. Uranus wants to improve your life, to bring more awareness and sophistication, to bring new understanding about what's going on. So, one of the things you are going to experience during a Uranus transit is either you will see your computer break down or you will meet someone who will completely open your mind, change the way you think. Now, why is your computer breaking? Because Uranus says, elevate which means it will, it will destroy everything that's old, everything that's obsolete, everything that is outdated. And so it can create a crisis because you're, you're not upgrading your life. So it, it pushes you for a massive upgrade. And sometimes it's because you receive a nice Christmas gift, you know, you've got a new computer with new features, better memory, whatnot. But it can also happen through a fact that whatever you created is not working anymore. You know, your methods are obsolete. Your equipment is obsolete. And it's money. It costs, Uranus is, is actually an expensive planet because Upgrading your life is an ex usually an expensive process. In a very mundane way, it, it, you know, people who have a strong Uranus will only buy designer clothes because they want the upgrade, they want the sophisticated, they want the refined, you know, the quality. But in a more, you know, more spiritual way, if we may say, Uranus has to do with... Um, awakening with 
stepping outside your comfort zone and realizing you, you know, you have to work on your relationships. You need a better relationship. So let's say Uranus transits your seventh house, transits your Venus. What are you going to feel in your relationship? Doubt. And what's the doubt? You feel that your partner is holding you back. You feel that you're not progressing. So Uranus wants to bring progress. And if you don't have progress, you're going to feel bored. You're going to feel unstimulated. And you are going to uh, lose interest in your job, in your partner, in your lifestyle. You are going to feel restless. So Uranus is that taste of newness. There is a way to take this to a higher level. And that's why, you know, you can lose interest. And, and if, you, if you don't work on your relationship, the gaps are then expanding. And your relationship is going to have, you know, um, you're going to grow apart from your partner. You're going to lose interest in them and eventually break up. The other thing that Uranus does is that it, it accelerates everything. So the things that you've been doing for a long time need to now be done faster. So whether you're studying something, whether you're driving a car, whether you have equipment, Uranus wants to quicken because it doesn't want to spend time on the same thing over and over again. Uranus is interested in progressing to more complex environment, more complex questions. So we're not going to spend 10 hours, you know, milling the same grains over and over again. We're going to invent a machine that does it more fast, that does it faster, so we can do other operations we can save the time to do something you know more meaningful perhaps a new recipe i hope that makes sense so uranus is basically uh, reflecting the higher mind it takes you away from the emotions, away from the physical, to the highest mental faculty, understanding, clarity, vision, the future. Up. Pluto, exactly the opposite. I mean, both are change, yes, both are revolutionary, both are radical, but Pluto is, has a completely different way of going about it, and Pluto goes down, down to the emotional body. Pluto is going what, to what is under the surface, what is buried, and Basically, think about it logically. When you see a tree, you see what's above the surface. You see its branches reaching to the sun, climbing higher and higher. And the higher it is, the more Uranian energy that tree has. So it's branching up. But the roots are nourishing that tree and they are under the surface and they go as deep as it goes high it must go down so this there is a replica of you know whatever you see above the surface is what is going on under the surface and pluto is that it's about going under the surface because that's where all the nutrition is. 
that's where everything is being processed. But on a on a on a soul level, Pluto is going to expose us to all our inadequacies, insecurities, fears, all the things we fail at. This is why very Plutonian people, Scorpionic people, usually have a rough start. Because they start with not being handsome, not being rich, not being loved, not having. They start with lack. They start with facing everything that is not enough. <clears throat> and, you know, it, it goes deep to a, you know, to a place of insecurity, fear of abandonment, and, and uh, attachment disorders. Because they have a fear of abandonment, they can latch onto things even stronger. And then, obviously, it doesn't work because the stronger you hold, the more painful the failure is. And that's the thing. Pluto takes you straight to the pain. Straight to uh, where the problem is. But where the emotional problem is. So Pluto accesses the emotional body. And the reason Pluto goes to the emotional body is because it knows that that's where the center of everything is. We talked about earlier the personal planets, the luminaries, the sun and the moon being the control room of our consciousness. And that's where Pluto goes. As the next water sign after cancer, Pluto is destroying our control room. It's, it's confronting our ego. All our attachments, all the things that we you know, hold for dear life, are being doubted, questioned. So you may experience, you know, someone born with a Pluto moon. What's going to happen there? What is in doubt? Where are the insecurities? In all aspects of my nurturing, of my family, my mother, so maybe I feel that my mother doesn't love me. Maybe I feel that my mother is not available. Maybe my mother passed away. Maybe my parents divorced and I'm experiencing a family rupture, Pluto moon. Or maybe my mother is having separation anxiety and I'm experiencing this Plutonian energy through her own insecurities. And maybe a, a child born with a Pluto moon is a child that already comes from past life experiences of rejection of broken families. And as a result, this is going to be a baby who will become much more attached, obsessively attached to their parents and have serious separation anxiety because there is a past life memory of loss. And as a, ch as a parent, you have no idea why your kid is so obsessive and why they need so much care and attention unless you look at the chart and you see there's a Pluto moon there and you realize something happened prior to this birth. And if you understand it, you can help it. <clears throat> so Pluto, if Pluto is in aspect to Jupiter, then it will expose the shadows of belief systems. 
and blind faith and people who get carried away by excessive charismatic power. So they are going to, um, you know, dig the dirt of behind spiritual institutions, churches. And you know, it's not a coincidence that last year as Jupiter was in Scorpio, you know, the sign of Pluto, we had the whole, you know, uh, you know, another wave of sexual abuse allegation against priests and monks because that's part of part of our emotional issues so why is pluto often taking it to the sexual level why is there often sexual abuse related to pluto because sexuality is immediately relating to our emotions and so the moment we are not emotionally healthy, emotionally adjusted, it's going to show in our sexual behavior. In our, it's going to show obsessively in one way or another. The bottom line is that Pluto brings deep introspection in our emotional insecurities because it seeks to transform us emotionally. <clears throat> and the message for Pluto is you can do it. If you do the work, if you face those limitations, if you go and seek a therapist, you can be the instrument of change. It is in your hands. That's why there's the whole aspect of resurrection associated with Pluto is that help it will not come at random. It's in your hand. That's why Pluto is a higher octave of Mars, the warrior. So here you're not a warrior in a battlefield, but you're a warrior against your own demons, your own fears and insecurities. But it's up to you, Mars, Pluto. And if the work is done, you will rise to a higher level than the one you descended from. The message for Pluto is empowerment. Now, on a spiritual level, what Pluto does is in complete resonance with the needs of Uranus. Because what is the function of the emotional body that Pluto is so, you know, fiercely working on? Pluto is trying to expand the emotional body. Because the emotional body is where everything is being integrated, gestated, processed. And so it's working on having a better processor. Why? So you can receive more from the higher world. So if we look at the analogy of the tree, sorry to skip here. This is Uranus Pluto. Ascend, ascension, Uranus, descent, Pluto. And so Look at the trees. If, if you have healthy roots, whatever is absorbed from the sun, from the high branches, will be integrated, processed in those roots. And the roots will nourish back the branches. So in a way, Pluto is working on expanding the container of Uranus. It's the cup. So we each have a cup. And if that cup is filled with knowledge, with understanding, with wisdom, or with emotions, then it saturates at some point, And there's nothing more you can add. The same way you go out on the street and you tell someone randomly that 
there's a universal order and that astrology is a cosmic clock they won't understand you because their cup is not equipped to absorb this knowledge and they're going to think you're crazy but then they will go through their emotional crisis they will um, have an existential crisis and they will have to ask their questions and they will destroy their foundation and rebuild a new container a new vessel a bigger one so that uranus may bring the awareness and the goods down from the heavens in a place that can contain it so this is this double triangle the triangle of going down and the triangle of going up and both are necessary because both obviously serve the same purpose so uranus works on the higher mind and it's always more it's always more you know appealing to go to the uranian world because we all want to go up we all want greater awareness and epiphanies and reach greater heights what we often avoid is to go down no one wants to go down we all want uranus nobody wants pluto and that's why pluto is often pissed because we don't do the plutonian work we want to ascend without roots and that's what happened here this is the chart of the beginning of the arab spring and that's the beginning actually of the pluto uranus square in 2010 so what happened is this young man mohammed bozizi was a tunisian merchant and you know uh, he had a bad day when a policeman confiscated his product because he didn't have the right licenses and he set himself on fire in front of the tunisian parliament and eventually died from his injuries and that ignited the arab spring all across north africa and the middle east leading to a massive revolution and a call for better human rights democracy and transformation but what really happened we haven't touched on neptune yet that's our next step but just to look at this chart with the pluto transit on the north node square uranus at the end of pisces about to move into aries jupiter about to move into aries as well <coughs> and that's the second pass of uranus because uranus was earlier on already in aries he just retrograded back to pisces and ready to now fully come into aries so things were already cooking the whole year but that was the trigger point and who ignited it but an aries who had mars on his south node so he was the ignition factor for the whole revolution now what happened during this a very quick sweeping revolution through social media uranus and jupiter a big wave of awakening of higher realization of a vision for a better future and everybody was on board everybody was on social media and in no time two months i mean on february 11th 2011 you see the egyptian dictator mubarak falling after more than 40 years in power he fell you know in a space of six weeks 
and the same happened in Tunisia, and the same happened eventually in Libya, and the same eventually happened uh, in other uh, Middle Eastern countries. And the same protest occurred in Syria. So, if we look now at those Middle Eastern countries, we look at Libya, we look at Syria, do we see the Uranian Enlightenment? Do we see a better future of democracy? So where did we go wrong? Why hasn't this revolution succeeded? And the reason is Pluto. Everyone gravitated towards Uranus. And very quickly, in a very Uranian way, wanted to elevate the standards, better human rights, more democracy. But instead, what happened is that the leadership was removed without proper routing, without having done the shadow work, the reason why that leadership was there for so many years. If you don't do the shadow work, the change will be superficial. It's not going to be sustainable. And what happens is that you create a vacuum of power. And then who comes if the roots are not dealt with? You will see the shadows moving in. You will see the dark forces using this vacuum. And then you have forces like, you know, the complete anarchy in Libya complete anarchy in Syria and ISIS, you know, which was, doesn't matter which conspiracy theory you subscribe to, it was very brutal. It was one of the most Plutonian dark episodes that humanity recently faced, you know, when we saw people mercilessly decapitated for entertainment, you know, a, sh a, a, a travesty of power and and brutality being celebrated so we saw basically that instead of the uranian enlightenment and advancement we got the darkest plutonian force instead and that's pluto uranus squaring they need to work together that's the purpose of the square but because we gravitated more towards the Uranus, we neglected the Pluto, what happened is the backlash. So we go back to, uh, to this equation. If we go up, we must go down at the same rate with the same intensity. And if we look at our culture, this is not a culture that encourages deep emotional work. It encourages quick enlightenment, Uranus. A uh, question about the, the, the width. Um, you have to understand that the width of the aspect is not just a particular event. The Arab Spring lasted, you know, more than a year, and the problem in Syria occurred, you know, over many years. So this was just, as I said, a process in action. 
And eight, you know, when you look at, uh, at degrees, you can definitely go up to 10 degrees. So Uranus was in Aries in June and was very tied to Pluto. So we're looking at a period of time. We're not looking at a specific day. Um, and that's, you know, a learning, another learning lesson in astrology is that we have to look at things from a process point of view. If we want to analyze this Pluto-Saturn, Pluto-Uranus square, we also have to go back to the original conjunction in the 60s. What happened in the 60s, the civil right movement and so forth. Mm -hmm. That was all an echo of what happened in the mid-2010-15 uh, with Black Lives Matter and police brutality all repeating within those years as an echo of the original 60s events. Same thing with healthcare, same thing with, you know, uh, we don't have time to get into this because I want to now proceed to Neptune. So just a, a look at the different Plutonian events. Pluto's in Capricorn now and we see you know, all the political structure being uh, completely revisited, the doubts of the system, the banking system, the use of power, the abuse of power and authority. And then, you know, this lava explosion, um, scorched earth is very Plutonian when we eradicate everything because the underworld, the fire from the underworld comes to surface and basically destroys everything. Um, it's a whole story of its own. It's another study, what happened in Hawaii during the last volcanic eruption that basically came out of nowhere from cracks in the middle of a neighborhood. It didn't even spill from the crater directly it went underground and came up to surface which is you know a scary scenario but a lot to look into now we're looking at uranus in taurus and i want to look at you know this vision of taurus being the earth uranus being the sky and it's about combining a vision of you know elevating architecture bringing ecology with technology that's the um, the ultimate vision of uranus in taurus to to upgrade our arts to upgrade our foods to upgrade our connection to the earth and upgrade our architecture and so this is an actual project in India to build a completely self-sustainable building complex that would produce enough energy to actually support its own consumption. And this is also another aspect of Uranus in Taurus, sacred geometry, perfect alignment of form to match complex uh, natural laws and and higher knowledge and this was you know the image you saw here is the interior of the sagrada familia cathedral in barcelona which is a monumental masterpiece um, of modernity and traditional uh, methods of architecture and also look at the texture, you know, something very uh, ancient combined with something very modern, which is very Uranus and Taurus. And interestingly, the architect Gaudi was born with Uranus and Taurus himself, conjunct Pluto. And interestingly, he also had Neptune in Pisces the same way we do now. So this is his transit that is a re repetition of his own 
of his own uh, chart pattern. And another person born with the, in the same period of time is Tesla, who also had Uranus in Taurus and Neptune in Pisces. So another genius who, you know, whose genius was to combine sky and earth. And one of the gifts of Tesla, we know, was not just the, the electric system, but it was also the, some kind of code for unlimited amounts of energy, which is very Neptune in Pisces, the infinite. But interestingly, these two folks who were born with the same current alignments. Now, the dark side of Uranus in Taurus is obviously when the sky rapes the earth. When Uranus rapes Gaia and you end up having <clears throat> basically a technology overriding raping nature and you know, the consequences of that. So to move to Neptune, Neptune in Pisces, you know, it's in, it's in its own sign. It's one of a very, very powerful and complex uh, archetype. So if we speak of the up and down of Uranus and Pluto, Neptune is about understanding where and why we're doing everything that we're doing. <clears throat> why are we evolving? Why are we changing? Why are we sweating? Why are we waking up every morning? So Neptune represents our ultimate motivation to be. And this is why it has to do with our deepest spiritual experience. But Neptune has to basically relate to, um, just going to check the chat. <clears throat> Neptune basically represents um, what is beyond us, the forces that existed before we were created. Because we're born into a universe that is already there. And what are the things we receive from the universe? All the elements, water, earth, air, fire. We receive the sun, we receive the soil, food, we receive the water, the rain, and we receive oxygen. It's just a gift. We don't need to, to buy it, we don't need to produce it, it's just there. That's Neptune. Something bigger than us, bigger than our ego, created this universe. But the same way we receive from Neptune, because these are things we did not create, it also means that these are things we do not understand. So we receive something, we live by it, but we don't fully know where it's coming from, where it's going. This is why Neptune, the 12th house, Pisces, represent our unconscious because these are things that we just take for granted. You know, when you go about your day and you breathe every second, you don't ask yourself, is there enough oxygen? Uh, where is my next breath gonna come from? You're just breathing naturally. And when the sun rises every morning, you don't think, oh, will it rise today? Wait, wait, I hope today the sun's gonna rise. I'm so afraid it won't. No, it's going to and so forth. So you, you kind of take for granted that the sky is blue and the trees are green and that you have two limbs, two arms, and that you, know, you, you do with what you have. 
This is why Neptune has to do with a passive principle of existing. It's what happens mechanically, organically, without you needing to supervise it. There's a stronger force that supervises it for you, um, at least to a certain extent. But this is why <coughs> Neptune has to do with trust. You trust in the universe, the same way a baby trusts their parents. You trust the sun will rise, you trust there's enough air, you trust, you know, there's enough water in the ocean. And because you trust, you can close your eyes and have a nap and sleep. Because you trust, you remain sane and you're not going crazy. Because if your trust in the universe is shattered, that's when trouble begins. That's where paranoia begins. And a series of consequences. So what is Neptune in our chart? Neptune represents, again, our understanding of what is this all about? But at the same time, it represents the ability not to have all answers and to accept the mystery. So in fact, both Uranus and Pluto in their transformation and work and lightnings and, and radical revolutions. Everything they do is to get to Neptune. They want to peel layers. They want to go higher and dig deeper to get answers, to solve the mystery. In fact, Pluto Uranus are striving to make us gods to empower us so we may actually not just develop our spiritual consciousness, but so that we may develop our faculties, our knowledge, our understanding, so we may become active participants in this creation as opposed to passively drift with it without understanding it. So Neptune represents our ignorance Whereas Uranus represents our understanding. You see how different they are. So in our chart, Neptune represents our relationship with life. And if we get along with life, if we like our lives. Or in other words, if we get along with life, it means are we happy? It represents our general sense of happiness, our ability to make with what we have and to trust that even though we don't know everything, we're going to figure it out. Neptune represents also being part of the ecosystem. That's why it represents our immune system, because as you are part of the ecosystem, you have a necessary um, component, antibodies, and you can adapt to the environment without being allergic to it. So people who suffer from tremendous allergies and autoimmune disorders is a Neptune issue. It's an adaptation issue. And whether these are environmental pollutants or whether it's a deeper existential angst, it goes back to Neptune. So Neptune represents basically whether we get along with our lives or not. Or in other words, 
whether we want to be here or not. Want to wake up, want to work, want to sweat. Why? Because if I said that Neptune is about all the gifts we got from the universe and we passively receive them, there is an expectation through Neptune that everything will be taken care of. That life is good and it's a self-regulating mechanism. So one of the things that Neptune is not fully understanding initially is how to deal with friction or how to deal with suffering. Because from a Neptune point of view, if I trust the universe, everything should be good. The bad people should go to prison. The good people should thrive. And we should all get along for me to feel safe in this universe and trust it. But the other side of Neptune is that nothing is taken for granted. And even though everything is provided, it's provided in its raw form. And therefore, just like we receive <coughs> fruits from the tree and, and enough nutrients, we need to know how to eat them. What parts of, you know, do you need the nucleus? Do you, need, do you peel the skin? or eat the skin. Um, when is a fruit ready to be eaten? Do you eat it when it's green, when it's yellow, when it's rotten? All these things you have to figure out. So while Neptune wants to be in innocence, wants to trust everything and just go with the flow without any resistance, it comes into this world without skin without a defense mechanism and as a result wherever our neptune is in our chart we experience great vulnerability <clears throat> overexposure no protection naive trust and because of that we can experience victimization and a wake-up call that can be very shocking. And this kind of difficulty or challenge is not, you know, because we did anything bad or because we hurt and we're getting payback for that. We're simply getting hurt because we are too naive and we don't and we, and we don't do the work we're supposed to be doing. Now, during this period of Neptune in Pisces, one of the things we see is a growing existential crisis. More than ever, we're becoming aware of the ecological crisis and the feeling that we are at a tipping point where we may not make it. Pisces is the last sign of the zodiac. It's the end of a cycle. And there's some, a feeling of something will collapse. It's kind of a doom and gloom. We had the Mayan calendar just as Neptune entered Pisces, you know, creating already a conditioning for something is, you know, it's a countdown. But it's not just the Mayan calendar. We see that we are on the verge of a sixth extinction. We see that nature is struggling to survive in an overpopulated world. And that if we don't adapt quickly, Uranus, to the changing circumstances, where you know, our reality is not sustainable. So we are facing this question of whether we want to be here or not, whether we can be here or not. And are we getting along with our lives or is our life out of control? 
And that's the feeling with Neptune is that you are not in control and you are overwhelmed. And you are in the middle of the ocean. You don't have clear sense of direction. So if you don't trust, you sink. And it's very interesting, some of you followed on my Facebook page, that just as this is happening, as this transit is really marching on, and these existential question raise, I mean, what, one of the things that emerged during the Neptune in Pisces uh, cycle was the right to die and to receive euthanasia whether you are suffering from diseases and you don't want to go through the whole painful process you want to mean if you don't have a quality of life you you have the prerogative to end your life but then someone took it even further and he is suing his parents for giving birth to him. And he's asking himself, why should I suffer? Why must I be stuck in traffic? Why must I work, face war, feel depression? Or in other words, I cannot take suffering. So he represents this deepest existential angst and reluctance to be born, which is one of the deepest Neptunian experience because wherever Neptune is in our chart, we have that reluctance to be here. If people with a strong 12th house or a strong Pisces have difficulty existing in the material dimension there is a secret death wish some of them may actually leave and commit suicide or self-destruct others will go through the motions but there's a continual feeling of you know how do I cope with suffering so we all have it. I mean, it's nothing, you know, specific to this young man. He just takes it to, to a very extreme level. But we, we actually ask ourselves the same questions. How, why do we, you know, why is there injustice in the world? Why do we kill each other? We all want peace. So why isn't it happening? We all want justice, and why is it not a matter of fact? So the transit of Neptune is about <clears throat> really going deeper and deeper into what is life about? And how can I be happy? How can I make peace with this thing called life on Earth? Now, some Neptunian people will say, oh, it's all wonderful, you know, look at the full glass, appreciate what you have. Beauty is, you know, this is in the simple pleasures. Others will feel like this world is a big monster waiting to consume them. They are overwhelmed. They can't cope with the stress and with the cruelty and with the difficulty. But wherever Neptune is, we, this is why we tend to numb our senses because we're too exposed and, and there's so much we can take in. But ultimately, what's the spirituality in this? What is the meaning of spirituality? If Neptune is in Pisces, which is the most spiritual combination, it also shows the exact opposite. Cynicism, loss of trust, 
feeling of being abandoned by God and a sense of doom and gloom that there is no solution. It gives us a sense of drowning. And we all feel that at some level, some more than others. So you understand the difference between all these outer planets. Pluto will say, I'm going to go through this tunnel. I'm going to dig and, and meet suffering face to face so I can exercise it. I am the therapist and I'm, I know that it's in my hands. Neptune says, I don't understand this. I want to be in harmony with everything, but I don't find always the tools to be able to do that. But Neptune's power is in that communication with life, is in that dialogue. And knowing that life talks to us, that there's a lot we can learn from life, and that if we are in tune, we get our answers. Only only um, only if you're humble can you listen and neptune will then lead you well so neptune is about dissolve your expectations it's not going to be the way you anticipate but if you are loyal to the truth because there is a higher truth that is absolute then you will be able to make it and you'll understand. And Uranus is that bridge between Saturn and Neptune, between the physical dimension. So like a rocket, it's kind of leaving Earth to go to the realm of Neptune, which is stillness. And it's interesting that Uranus is speeding up and speeding up and speeding up to reach Neptune, where Neptune is no speed at all, because there's no movement in Neptune. It's timeless. And that's the interesting thing, is that the moment we will reach the speed of light, we will go back in time. So, a lot of things to ponder on. Most importantly, I wanted to give you a glimpse of the nature of this work. I encourage you to check those two books, the one on, you know, that goes very uh, methodically through Neptune in each placement and planets in the 12th house. And the second one, focuses on actually the sun and the moon in each house and sign as well as the level of evolution of the soul and that's what we're going to do if we study together it is to understand not just the outer planet but the whole chart from the perspective of evolution and learning to find true solutions for ourselves and, and for our clients. So <clears throat> the good thing is that if you listen to this, I, I, like I said, I give you a payment plan. Consider taking your astrology seriously. Consider that this is a potential profession for you and it is also a potential tool for your own growth. If you sign up in February and you listen to this course, you will be also getting a 5% discount. So many thanks to all of you and 
looking forward to more stars, more space, and solar love. <laughs>